used to be a physicist. I uh, was trained in Austria, got my PhD at the University of Vienna, and spent 20 years doing research in theoretical high energy physics. I left physics in the mid 80s and turned to what the life sciences where a new conception of life has been emerge, emerging during the last 30 years or so. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. At the forefront of contemporary science, the universe is no longer seen as some kind of a machine composed of elementary building blocks. We have discovered that the material world ultimately is an inseparable network of relationships. That the planet as a whole is a living, self-regulating system. The view of the human body as a machine and of the mind as a separate entity has given way to a view that sees not only the brain, but also the immune system, the bodily tissues, and even each single cell as a living cognitive system. Evolution is no longer seen as a competitive struggle for existence, but rather as some kind of cooperative dance in which uh, creativity and the constant emergence of novelty are the driving forces. And with a new emphasis on complexity, networks, and patterns of organization, a new science of qualities is now slowly emerging. During the last 30 years, I developed a synthesis of this new understanding of life, a conceptual framework that integrates four dimensions of life, the biological, the cognitive, the social and the ecological dimension. I presented summaries of this framework as it, as it evolved in several books. And my final synthesis is published in a textbook called The System's View of Life, written with a friend and colleague, Pierluigi Luisi, who is a professor of biochemistry in Rome. I call my synthesis the system's view of life because it requires a new kind of thinking, thinking in terms of patterns, relationships, and context. And in science, this kind of thinking is known as systems thinking or systemic thinking. Systems thinking emerged in the 1920s, and during the 1970s and 80s, it was raised to a new level with the development of complexity theory, technically known as nonlinear dynamics. It is a new mathematical language that allows scientists for the first time to handle the enormous complexity of living systems mathematically. The new nonlinear mathematics is a mathematics of patterns, of relationships. <coughs> Strange attractors and fractals are examples of such patterns. They are visual representations of the system's complex dynamics. Now, during the last 30 years, the strong interest in nonlinear phenomena generated a whole series of new and powerful theories that have dramatically increased our understanding of some key characteristics of life. My synthesis of these theories is what I refer to as the system's view of life. To present it properly, it would take a whole course. And in fact, I'm teaching such a course now online. It's called Capra course, easy to remember. And if you're interested, the website is capracourse.net. Well, here I can give you only a few highlights of the new systemic understanding of life. One of its most important insights is the recognition that networks 
are the basic pattern of organization of all living systems. Ecosystems are understood in terms of food webs, that is, networks of organisms. Organisms are networks of cells, and cells are networks of molecules. So the network is a pattern that is common to all life. Wherever we see life, we see networks. And indeed, at the very heart of the change of paradigms, from the mechanistic to the systemic view of life, we find a fundamental change of metaphors, from seeing the world as a machine to understanding it as a network. That's really the, the gist of my synthesis. If you just want to remember, remember this one sentence, it's the shift from seeing the world as a machine to understanding it as a network. Well, closer examination of these living networks has shown that their key characteristic is that they are self-generating. In a cell, for example, all the structures you see, the membranes, the DNA, the proteins, all these cellular structures are continually produced, repaired, and regenerated by the cellular network. Similarly, at the level of a multicellular organism, the bodily cells are continually regenerated and recycled by the metabolic network. So living networks continually create or recreate themselves by transforming or replacing their components. And in this way, they undergo continual structural changes while at the same time preserving their web-like pattern of organization. This ex coexistence of stability and change is indeed one of the key characteristics of life. And now let me concentrate on one of the most important and most radical philosophical implications of this new understanding of life. It is a new conception of the nature of mind and consciousness which finally overcomes the Cartesian division between mind and matter that has haunted philosophers and scientists for centuries. You may remember that in the 17th century, René Descartes based his view of nature on the fundamental division between two independent and separate realms, that of mind, which he called the thinking thing, res cogitans in Latin, and that of matter, the extended thing, res extensa. Following Descartes, scientists and philosophers continued to think of the mind as a thing, as some kind of intangible entity, and they were not able to figure out how this thinking thing could um, interact with the body. The decisive advance of the system's view of life has been to recognize that mind is not a thing, it is a process. Mind and consciousness are processes. This novel conception of mind was developed in the 1960s by Gregory Bateson, who used the term mental process, and independently by Umberto Maturana, who focused on cognition, the process of knowing. In the 1970s then, Maturana and Francisco Varela uh, expanded Maturana's initial work into a full-fledged theory, which is now known as the Santiago theory of cognition. The central insight of the Santiago theory is the identification of cognition the process of knowing with the process of life. Cognition, according to Maturana and Varela, is the activity involved in the self-generation and self-perpetuation of living networks. In other words, cognition is the very process of life. The self-organizing activity of living systems at all levels of life is mental activity. The interactions of a living organism, plant, animal, or human being, 
with its environment are cognitive interactions. And so life and cognition are inseparably connected. The process of cognition, or if you wish, of mind, is immanent in matter at all levels of life. Well, this is a radical expansion of the concept of cognition and implicitly the concept of mind. In this new view, cognition involves the entire process of life, including perception, emotion, and behavior, and does not even necessarily require a brain and a nervous system. Plants, for example, or even bacteria, neither of which have a nervous system, are constantly engaged in cognitive activities involving their sensory apparatus and various self-organizing processes. Now, this identification of mind or cognition with the process of life is a novel idea in science. But in fact, it is one of the deepest and most archaic intuitions of humanity. In ancient times, the rational human mind was seen as merely one aspect of the immaterial soul or spirit. The basic distinction was not between body and mind, but between body and soul or body and spirit. And both soul and spirit were described in the languages of ancient times with the metaphor of the breath of life. When you look at the words, the words for soul, the Sanskrit Atman, uh, the Greek psyche, the Latin anima, they all mean breath. The same is true of the words for spirit. The Latin spiritus, the Greek pneuma, the Hebrew ruach, these too mean breath. So the common ancient idea behind all these words is that of soul or spirit as the breath of life. Similarly, the concept of cognition in the Santiago theory goes far beyond the rational mind as it includes the entire process of life. Describing it as the breath of life seems to be a perfect metaphor. So cognition is the breath of life, the very essence of the process of living. Now, in science, when you have a radically new concept like that, you need to show that it actually helps in our understanding of natural phenomena, that it's not just a game of words. In the case of the Santiago theory, the conceptual advance is easily appreciated by revisiting the thorny question of the relationship between mind and brain. This has confused scientists and philosophers for centuries. And even if you read current textbooks in neuroscience, you will see this confusion there. The Cartesian, this, in the Santiago theory, this relationship is simple and clear. The Cartesian concept of mind as a thing is abandoned. Mind is not a thing, but a process the process of cognition, which is identified with the process of life. And the brain is a specific structure through which this process operates. So the relationship between mind and brain, quite simply, is one between process and structure. Moreover, the brain is not the only structure through which the process of cognition operates. The entire structure of the organism participates in the process of cognition, whether or not the organism has a brain and a higher nervous system. So when Maurizio just before said he felt it in his gut, that's a cognitive process. Or when you have a muscle memory of a past trauma, that's a cognitive process. Well, now we have a scientific theory to go with it. So cognition, and under, as understood in the Santiago theory, is associated with all levels of life and is therefore a much broader phenomenon than consciousness. Consciousness, that is conscious lived experience, 
unfolds at a certain level of cognitive complexity that require a brain and a higher nervous system. In other words, consciousness is a special kind of cognitive process that emerges when cognition has reached a certain level of complexity. The central characteristic of this special cognitive process is the experience of self-awareness. To be aware not only of one's environment, but also of oneself. Well, this is just a sort of a teaser of this new conception of mind and consciousness. And even if I spoke now for an hour to explain it to you, I would still not expect you to just accept it and understand it. It has taken me literally years and years to absorb this knowledge. And many of the details of this science of mind and consciousness still remain to be clarified and integrated. However, we now have the outlines of a scientific theory that overcomes the Cartesian division of mind and matter that has haunted Western science and philosophy for more than 300 years. Mind and matter no longer appear to belong to two separate categories, but can be seen as representing two complementary aspects of the phenomenon of life, process and structure. At all levels of life, mind and matter, process and structure are inseparably connected. For the first time, we have a scientific theory that unifies mind, matter, and life. And I hope that uh, by the time she grows up, this will be common knowledge. Thank you. <laughs>